My name's Toby Camps. I'm curator of modern contemporary art at the Manil Collection. Welcome. And could before we start, could we take one moment just to silence these infernal devices, please? For more than a decade, the Vivian L. Smith Foundation has provided significant grants in support of the doctorate level art history fellowship program administered by the Manil Collection in the University of Texas at Austin. This unique program has served as a catalyst for the careers of numerous aspiring scholars, encouraged intellectual discourse between curators and graduate students, and resulted in a wide variety of free public programs, lectures, discussions, and research symposium of enormous benefit to scholars and the general public. During these unique residencies, pre-doctoral students spend their time completing their dissertations and preparing symposia like the one you are about to experience tonight. They study the museum's permanent collection under the guidance of Manil curators. The doc doctoral candidates also conduct ancillary research in the Manil's archives and library, pursue technical investigations with members of the Manil's conservation team, and expand their dissertation projects by accessing the Manil's networks of curators, art historians, private collectors, galleries, and independent scholars. Pre-doctoral fellowship programs of this scope are quite rare in the United States, and we're extremely grateful to the Vivian L. Smith Foundation for this important support. Over the years, Vivian L. Smith Fellows have conducted groundbreaking research and gone on to land prestigious positions in museums and universities across the country. The current exhibition, Takis, The Fourth Dimension, which is just down the hallway, was inspired by fellow Melissa Warwick, who presented a symposium pr entitled Hearing Post-War Art that brought together musicians and art historians to discuss and perform a wide range of works combining visual and sonic elements. And last year's symposium, Materiality in Post-War Art, organized by Roja Najafi, brought together distinguished scholars Kent Mintern from Columbia University, Alexander Potts from the University of Michigan, and Richard Schiff from the University of Texas at Austin to talk about the tactile as well as the visual aspects of art on both sides of the Atlantic in mid-century. And this also included a, a related um, seminar at Rice University here in Houston. Currently, former Vivian L. Smith fellows hold jobs at the Art Institute of Chicago, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the University of Texas at El Paso, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, and many other institutions. This year's fellow, Allison Myers, is studying French and American exchanges in art in the 1970s, especially in conceptual and abstract painting. At the Manil, her work has been centered on the archives, looking into the roles of John and Dominique de Manil in facilitating this interchange. She's also been studying the abiding influence of the curator Germaine McCaggy, an important early colleague and advisor to the de Manils. Additionally, Allison has worked with the Manil paintings conservator, Katrina Rush, to examine the works of Polish-French artist Roman Opalka, and she played an important role in organizing the recent symposium on the late works of Barnett Newman, organized by curator Michelle White and chief conservator Brad Epley. Alice has an article coming out on the French artist group support surfaces and their connection to Maoism, and next year she'll move back to, be, to Austin to be the curatorial fellow at the UT's Visual Arts Center. And now I will let Allison introduce her symposium, Juxtapositions, the Meanings Between, and her distinguished speakers. Thank you, Toby, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all so much for choosing to spend your Saturday evening with us tonight. Um, this symposium has been a long time in the making, and I'm so pleased to see it come to fruition today. It's been a real honor to spend this year as a research fellow at the Manel. And I'd like to thank, first of all, the Vivian L. Smith Foundation for their generous support of the symposium and for their many years funding doctoral research and art history at the Manil. This support has produced, as Toby said, a tremendous amount of new scholarship over the years, and I'm grateful to have been able to add what little I could to that. I'm also lucky to have had the opportunity to work with some truly amazing people here at the Manel, without whom this symposium, I can assure you, would never have gotten off the ground. I'd like to first thank Toby and Eric Wolf for their guidance throughout the year, as well as the curators Michelle White, Paul Davis, and Claire Elliott for their insights and advice. 
Joseph Newland and Brooke Stroud generously opened their doors to talk ideas with me throughout the year, and Paul Doyle, Haley Berkman, and Tommy Napier provided much needed support to make today happen. As many of you know, nothing would happen here without the tireless work of Tony Martinez, Carl Killian, and Elsie and Cosens, and I thank them sincerely for all the help and advice that they gave in preparing this event. Finally, thank you very much to the speakers, Christina Van Dyke, Serge Guibo, and David Levi Strauss, um, for coming to Houston to share their insights on this thing we're calling juxtaposition. So I want to open this symposium with just a few words on how I came to organize it, and also how we might begin to define a notion of juxtaposition that's both useful and relevant for thinking about how we display and interpret works of art today. Um, this symposium was born out of my desire to understand how we as curators, writers, and historians influence and shape the things that we study. As a PhD student, my own work focuses on understanding that act of interpretation, specifically how our cultural and social baggage literally affects the way that we're able to see and interact with works of art in person. Um, in my dissertation, I do this by studying how people in the United States perceived and interacted with French art in the 1970s. But this symposium today really stems from those deeper foundational questions that I have about how we engage with art, how we interpret it, and how we also communicate those interpretations with other people. In some ways, it's kind of funny to have a symposium on juxtaposition because it's really a general sort of idea. You can really juxtapose anything you want, from images and objects to words, contexts, concepts, and you can do it in a lot of different ways, namely through exhibitions, through critical texts, and even artworks, of course, like collages. So the question is, how do we talk pointedly about something that we normally take for granted, something that forms the foundation of what we do as curators, writers, and historians? And how do we also, as viewers, take into account how such juxtapositions affect the way we understand works of art and the roles that they play in the world? Broadly speaking, I would say juxtaposition is a way of looking at things by focusing on the spaces between them. By placing and talking about things together, it helps us to think about them as elements of a larger conversation. In many ways, I think juxtaposition is uh, related to a very similar practice called comparison, which of course is one of the most fundamental tools we have for even understanding the world around us. But I think juxtaposition and comparison are very different in an important but basic way. A comparison involves listing out and naming specific similarities and differences in a kind of cataloging process. And for this reason, we use it in art history to identify stylistic groups, to create historical narratives, and those sorts of things. Juxtaposition, on the other hand, refers more simply to that basic act of placing something in proximity to another thing. Rather than naming similarities and differences, uh, this proximity opens a dialogue between artworks on many different levels, from their visual surfaces, their formal qualities, to the many inherited cultural contexts that inform how we see them. So at its core, juxtaposition has everything to do with interpretation. The act of placing something next to another thing implies an underlying reason for doing so. And this brings up some central questions at the heart of what it means, for instance, to curate an exhibition. Is juxtaposition an argument where the placement supports a definite conclusion? Or is it more of a tentative suggestion in which interpretation is a process that relies on the viewer to connect the dots or even to draw their own unanticipated lines between things? The Manil is a particularly resonant place to have a symposium on juxtaposition. And the concept was at the center of John and Dominique de Manil's collecting practices. And it also structured their vision for a museum that's based around the idea of an encounter. 
Um, in the 1987 catalog, Wal Walter Hopp summarized this idea pretty well when he described the Manil as, quote, a collection where the unexpected encounter, the unusual juxtaposition, and the solitary communion of an individual viewer and artwork are allowed. I'm very happy to be having this conversation here, and even happier to be having it with an amazing panel of speakers, each of whose work touches on this issue in very distinct ways. So tonight we'll hear short remarks from Serge Guibault, Christina Van Dyke, and David Levi Strauss. Afterwards, uh, we'll assemble at the table and I'll moderate a short roundtable discussion between them, and then we'll open up questions to the audience to have a more inclusive conversation. So um, right now, I'd like to uh, introduce Serge Guibault. Serge Guibault is a professor emeritus in the Department of Art History at the University of British Columbia. His book, How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art, Abstract Expressionism, Freedom in the Cold War, placed him as a leading scholar of French and American post-war art. Since then, he's authored and edited numerous articles and books in French, Spanish, and English. And in 1994, he was awarded the French title of Chevalier des Palmes Académiques, in 2007, he curated the major exhibition B-Bomb, Art, Fashion, and All That Jazz, Paris, New York, 1946 to 56, at Barcelona's Museum of Contemporary Art, which also received the award for Best Show of the Year from the Association of Catalan Art Critics. So you please join me in welcoming Serge Guibault. Thank you very much for the introduction, of course, and thank you for coming, as you said, in this beautiful day. Um, I wanted to, to thank the, the museum, of course, the, the, to, to organize this. Um, i like to say from the beginning that uh, uh, I didn't understand how um, this idea came uh, to Alison, because, and also at a moment that is so hot and so important. It's a, a juxtapositions and in between, as you know, is at the center of all the buzz and discussion on TV. Did you hear about uh, Bruce Jenner? <laughs> so I thought, how can she know that this gun is gonna happen? So great, so you are fantastic right there. So um, a, a few words about um, what the type of artistry I'm doing and the type of show I'm, I organized in the, you know, in the past. Um, because I'm myself uh, the result of uh, a juxtaposition, let's say. Uh, I am the result of um, a couple during, uh, that uh, met during the war. One was a, my mother, a Spanish refugee from Spain, from the Basque area, and my father was a running away soldier from the north of France, and they met, they met one time in a forest in the swimming pool, and uh, my mother loved the legs of my father because he was almost a professional soccer player, and I came out. So I understood, I understood that, uh, that that idea of uh, juxtaposition is very important because it told me a lot of things, by, by the way. It told me about, uh, that issue told me about uh, racism uh, because my mother in the north of France was subject to that type of stuff. So I learned that the hard way, but I never forgot it. And uh, uh, also, uh, I myself married a California surf girl. So uh, I had to uh, adapt to surfing with her or, you know, it was kind of difficult at first. Not really, it was, no, it was really fantastic. So we, but we met also in Paris, so she was also involved in exchange students between California and Bordeaux, University of Bordeaux, and so on. So that was quite interesting. So um, what I wanted to, to say is also uh, that um, from the beginning, my type of artistry I was doing uh, in France, for example, for my MA, I never liked it. I never liked the, the French way of doing artistry. I hated it. And I was always a pain in the neck for my profs and so on. And one time, uh, so I wanted to, to do something else than the French were doing. And at some point, I wanted to do um, American art. I was interested in, uh, in, that, in those days in Rosenberg. I was a fan of Rosenberg. I went to see a show in Paris, and I came back to my prof. I said I wanted to write about, uh, about some, something American. 
And my prof uh, said to me, uh, American art does not exist. So, sorry about, but you know, I mean, it's true, he, he, he said that. So then I said, well, um, I would like to go further and see, and say, okay, we'll do it. So then I applied for a, a grant, a Fulbright grant, and um, that was difficult to, so I, so I was picked up, so I thought, oh, it's all about art historians. So I went to Paris, and I mean, I don't, I'm gonna be a short thing, but Paris, I was invited in, uh, with the several high profs at Harvard, some uh, politicians, American politicians and so on, in the embassy, and I realized that we were 10 people, and um, we were interviewed, and all of them were all in business studies. I was the only art historian, so I said, okay, I'm done. And when I went into that room, the first question that the American uh, historian and politician asked me, why do you want to do to go to the States? Because American art does not exist. And I said, well, first of all, I said, well, let me go there, I'll find out, and I'll come back and tell you what I found. So that's, that's kind of worked a little bit well. But they say uh, something like, why do you want to go over there when all the American students want to come to France to learn art history? So again, I said, you know, well, I know a few and so I would like to go and so forth and so on. And I got that grant. So I, I was able to go over there and that was quite an, an important shift for me because when I arrived at UCLA, uh, the type of department I, I went in was totally cool. You know, I mean, really cool. And so you could do whatever you wanted. And you could argue, you could, I mean, they push you to argue, to take positions and so on. And I love that, because I was already an arguing, you know, as I said, a pain in the neck. So we had a, a fantastic time. And this is at the time when I, I realized also with some of the profs there that they were trying to change art history. And that's also something I like very much. And in those days, I don't know if you, don't, you don't remember, you're too young to remember that, but uh, in, in those days there was connoisseurship that was really the, the driving force. So you had to kind of, all you do is to, to recognize an artwork, to be a little bit formalist, and then to, to say how great the work was. And so we really got upset uh, about that. And so what I, my art history was to, to, uh, to put together Traditional art history, you mean you have to be a connoisseur, you have to be a formalist, but also you have to be, understand what the work says and also uh, take a position. So it was a, a juxtaposition of art and politics. A juxtaposition, art and politics. And of course, that was well uh, accepted at UCLA, but boy, we had a lot of trouble with the East Coast, I tell you that the established art school and art history school, very traditional, very old fashioned, very close to the French type. So we had a lot of discussion, a lot of fight. <laughs> I'm too French, I speak with my hands. Um, so we had a lot of, uh, lot of debates and, 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 and fight actually, really fight to the point that some places we were, we were booing people and people were booing us in, in, at the CAA, right? It was quite interesting. So I like that. And so I wanted to show you a little bit of what, um, no, there, no. Which one do I push? Yeah, Serge Guilbeault, that's me. <laughs> All right, so after that, after these uh, several books and you know, discussions, or symposium and so on, then um, I finally met a director of a museum that I really appreciate very much, and he was uh, uh, Manolo from uh, Barcelona, and uh, we had long discussions about art history and so on. And he asked me to participate to produce a show, so that's why I'm, I'm gonna show you a, a few examples um, about what I was trying to do in terms of juxtaposition. Because I have to say, and I know that's why I'm getting on the nerves of people, I have to say right away, I have a lot of problem with museums. A lot of problem with directors of museums. Um, because I think uh, museums are way behind uh, the times uh, in terms of thinking and in terms of relationship with the democratic world. So uh, the discussion is always around that. How do you organize it? When... So for example, uh, talking about juxtaposition, I had several problems with, uh, for example, um, I did a, a show of uh, uh, Jericho drawings in Vancouver, and so I knew somebody uh, very interesting at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, so we could borrow everything, so I borrow a lot of stuff. 
about racism, about the, the raft of the Medusa, about sexual in, encounters and things like that. And uh, um, I prepared the show, and the person, the curator from the from the, the, the Ecole des Beaux Arts de Paris, comes and absolutely almost fainted because what I did was I put a, a drawing of Jericho, who was doing some kind of landscape, next to a friend of his uh, of the time, that to show that they were working together, but they were very different. And actually, I was not uh, allowed to do this. The person said, you cannot do this because if you do, I said, why? You, you do this, you, you, you uh, diminish the, the value of the Jericho by putting next to this bozo. But I said, but he was his good friend, you know? I mean, they were together and so on. No, 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 Serge. It took me three, day, three days to discuss, to argue, to have dinners, suppers, drinking parties to convince that person that it was okay. And at the end, it was okay. Stuff like that, it happens all the time. Even at the Getty, I was part of the, uh, a, a huge program that we did about uh, California and so on. I wanted to have in the, in the exhibition that we were doing at the Getty, the, for example, uh, to show the atmosphere and the differences and the, f and the fight, the differences between Bohemia and, and avant-garde, for example. So I wanted to have beatniks. They have a fantastic beatnik, uh, of, um, what do you call that, archives with, with photographs, drawings, books, or whatever. It's fantastic stuff. So I wanted to have that, but also confronting somebody like, uh, you know, like uh, some of those, uh, uh, Sam Francis, for example, you know? That was absolutely anathema. And, the, and I said, why? And the argument was, again, the same thing. You are depreciating the San Francis. And I said, if that's the case, it's because the painting sucks, <laughs> right? So these, those type of discussion is an ongoing thing. Uh, and that's what I didn't, I didn't find uh, in, uh, in Barcelona, and I will not find in Madrid a show I'm, I'm organizing now. And I think they are, they are absolutely important issues. But they are not only, you know, you, in my mind, you not only put them together, you have to explain or to take a position as a curator to say, if I do this, it's because I think that it is worthwhile talking. There's a debate there. Those people are not producing those artworks for no reason. They were actually, they, sometimes artists don't know what they are for, but they certainly understand what they are against. And that's what is fascinating and interesting. Anyway, so, uh, for example, uh, what, I, what I've done in, uh, in, uh, in that show in Barcelona was something like this, to, um, to show a movie and a painting, um, a painting from a, a communist artist and also a, a filmmaker um, also doing leftist stuff. So, but the same story, it was about workers in the harbor in the, in next uh, to, uh, in Catalonia. So, so here you have those images of the, the filming, even the film was after, it was like three or four years after the painting that I showed you before. So what I always like to do is to present this, this um, uh, the poems that you have on top, I, I put them so like that you can see better because that, those were pictures in the room. And this is, I wanted to show, to discuss something important in 46, when Jackson Pollock changes from uh, being a Jungian interested in Jung, he became an individualistic, he moved into some other things that we call abstract expressionism, like, uh, like uh, uh, dripping. On the second half of the year uh, of 46, after the atomic bomb in Bikini. And of course, when you say that to art historian, traditional art historian, they hit the roof, right? Uh, because, no, there's not, but I think it, there is, there is a trust. That event of the Bikini explosion was all over the place in the newspaper, Life magazine had incredible reports about all these people were talking about this. They were all scared and so on. And, and, uh, and uh, in, the, in the autumn of 46, Jackson started to think about all this, about himself, about how, and, and that's a result of that thinking of uh, not me anymore, but the world, man, the world. And so uh, I want to, to, to show that with a film by Bruce Conner that he did in the 50, late 50s, um, in the same room, and, uh, and of course we explain, right? We explain, we, it's not didactic as I hate that word, and I heard that because I'm from 68, right? The university for us is always very dangerous because they try to, go to, they try to uh, promote stuff. They, they want to put stuff in your mind and you know, you're not free anymore, right? So I mean, that's an old story. So we wanted to, to, give, to give 
possibilities to the, pub, to the public who goes there to learn about things, to, to, um, to know about things, and then, then you can make a decision. For example, in one room, like uh, you had a, a battle in 1946 uh, about the notion of modern in, uh, in, uh, in the US, uh, a fight between Boston and New York. And so what was modern and what, what was really modern? So in Boston, they were more interested in kind of a traditional modern, like German expressionist kind of thing. And the, and the MoMA was abstract, you know. So the battle was between that, the form of a modern realist and abstraction. So what, what I've done is that on one wall, you can see the Boston position. On the other side, you can see the MoMA position. And in between, you have the debates, the debate between all the magazines, the reviews, and so on and so forth, photographs of Pollock and, and Greenberg also discussing and saying that uh, abstract expression is the best in the world and so on. So once we have done this in the show, uh, that people get all those information, then we have a room, uh, a large room, where you can produce, you can put some of the work itself. So like that, you can have a look. You can relate to the picture as we want to say in museums, one-on-one -on -one and feel, you know. But you don't feel only your gut or something, and, because now you know something. So you can look at it, and you are, you are uh, aware of the issues that those artists were confronted with, right? And not, uh, oh, wow. You look at the name, and that's about it. Sometimes you look at the collector's name, right? But uh, this is, to me, is quite important. So on one side, you have this. That's the Boston attitude. And the other side, you have those, like from uh, the abstract expressionist group, right? And, and they would not kind of uh, go together very well. So two minutes. Uh, I'm going to pass this then. But this is the image of, the, the image of France uh, in the American press in the 50s. Um, the Americans were lovers. Uh, the French were lovers. They were, they were like vols at the bottom. is always presented with his banjo and, uh, and, and sleeping or with a dog. And this on top over there, you have a, 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 a tapier, or Michel Charletien, uh, sleeping. Uh, is an art critic, famous art critic, and after that you even have the most abstract expressionist, violent uh, of French uh, uh, art at that time, Mathieu, that is represented as an odalisque. And so you can see the, the difficult, and Matisse is always there. So, so the, the culture now, in French culture, is represented as being old, uh, exhausted, in a sense, right? And Pollock is absolutely like this. That was the same year, like in around 51, 52. Pollock is the, the guy who jumps around, it, but we don't really know exactly what he's doing, right? On the other hand, we have Vols that is represented in, uh, in always in bed. He, he lives in an hotel, a small bed, and he has a, his small pictures and so on. And his work is not about ejaculation like, like Pollock, but it's more about, I said, it's like a pee-pee. It's like a <laughs> pee-pee stuff. But, but which one is better than the other one? None. I mean, they are, they are confronting a similar situation, and they give different answers. That's what is fa fantastic about art. But in the history of art, we forgot the poor Vols, and now, thanks to you, I mean, it started to be uh, maybe recognized to some degree. Uh, those are the pictures that you have here. But uh, my, one of my major points uh, of the show was to, for example, confront and confrontation is important. Confront Pollock and another painter, Bram van Velde, who was a Dutch painter, who was totally forgotten. And in 1952, he has an exhibition in the same street as Jackson Pollock. But Jackson Pollock, from all kinds of uh, question, propaganda, and so on and so forth, uh, he, the people go to see him. He's packed. And two, room, two, uh, two stores next to that gallery, Bram van Velde is there. And he has eight people to come to see the show. And that was including his brother, his wife, uh, kids, and so on and so forth. So nobody, and again, it's because Bram van Velde, uh, he does react to the war and to the post-war period in a very uh, erasing, erased way. I don't exist, what we are, we, are, we cannot explode, we cannot do all this stuff, we have to be very neutral, and not neutral, but we have to be um, simple and, uh, you know, all, I'm very happy because I can breathe, because those guys have been through a lot, right? So it's a different world than Jackson Pollock. So I did that, I juxtaposed the work that Pollock shows in 1952, actually he was changing and he, he was not anymore uh, on abstract expressionism, really, and him. And, and guess what? 
the people uh, who review the show, it was divided again. Half of them were saying, I don't know this guy, why do they, you know, Serge, what, you know, what, Brian Van Belde? I mean, what is that? Uh, an, uh, a writer for Art Forum, right? I did the same thing, so I invited that person to the show and we argued. That person agreed with me now. Because uh, now Brian Van Vell is becoming talked about. I mean, people start to talk about, they're interested in and so on. So I don't want it to, to create in the show or in the book, I don't want it to say, uh, like, like Greenberg, you know, I have a good taste. If you don't have my taste, you are a bozo. I'm not like this. I'm saying, well, I think this is what's happening because this, this, and that. You need a lot of uh, support, archives, and so on and so forth. But archives are not enough because archives are missing or somehow you can reread it in a different way and so on. But, but you take a position. And I think curators um, should take positions in their, in their uh, production and to say, I'm doing this show because this, this, and this, and that. What do you think? You know? And you give... Uh, you give um, possibilities to the public to, to read, because that's to me is the, uh, again, we were talking about that last night, to me is the greatness of democracy. We don't have it anymore. I mean, I know, I mean we know it's gone, it's a little different and so forth. But museums started, the dream of museum was a place where we could argue, we could discuss, and so on and so forth. And then it changed. It became, it became a, a, a white cube for connoisseurs only, for people who already have a lot of culture. So like that, we don't have to explain anything, right? But now it's over. I mean, now we are living in a, uh, in a touristic society, tourist. And, uh, and democracy still needs spaces where we can argue, discuss, and so on and so forth. So I think um, I, I'm, the type of, of, of um, juxtaposition I'm doing, for example, this one I stop, is, um, for example, in France, at some point, you have, a, you have two types, and you show that in the, in the, in the show, two types of, uh, of women. Uh, you have a singer, right, Juliette Greco, who comes from the, from the uh, underground, and she, she is very, um, uh, an existentialist, is very nasty about French culture, and she, she even has a song called I Hate Sundays. And of course, that in the French was horrible because someday you go to church, right? So it means that she hates religion. So it was a disaster, a lot of battles. And of course, just in a year later, so or two years later, you have Brigitte Bardot coming. And she didn't care about the church either. So it changes a lot the, the atmosphere. And, and Picasso understood that. So you have a Brigitte Bardot on one side. Those are kind of, of a juxtaposition that I think is interesting. And I think I have to stop because my 10 minutes are over. OK. So. <laughs> Thank you, Serge. Now we're going to hear from Christina Van Dyke. Uh, Christina Van Dyke is director of the Pulitzer Foundation for the Arts in St. Louis, Missouri. Before the Pulitzer, Christina was curator of collections and research at the Manil, where she organized exhibitions such as Chance Encounters, which looked at the formation of the Day Manil's African collection. Since being at the Pulitzer, Van Dyke has organized major programs and exhibitions, such as The Progress of Love, a cooperative effort between the Pulitzer, the Manil, and the Center for Contemporary Art in Lagos. She has recently led the Pulitzer through a renovation project that will almost double exhibition and programming space in the Tarawando designed building. The inaugural exhibitions, focusing on the work of Alexander Calder, Richard Tuttle, and Fred Sandback, opens next Friday. And I suggest that you make a trip up to St. Louis to see them. Please join me in welcoming Christina to the program. Well, it's great to be back. Um, thank you, Allison, for inviting me, and for inviting me to think about the role that juxtaposition has played in my own education and um, the works that I study and my approach to uh, curatorial work. So I'm going to kind of whip through some, um, first I'm gonna whip through Serge's slides. Wow. <laughs> I'm 
I hope this doesn't count against my time. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, so thinking back to my first encounter with this juxtaposition led me to think of Sesame Street. And for those of you who are watching Sesame Street in the 70s, you might remember that song, One of These Things Is Not Like the Other. Um, and this is a, a clip from YouTube where we learn very early that juxtaposition is a tool that helps us learn to see difference. Um, so we differentiate here letters from numbers. Moving forward, um, in my reflection on my education, I remembered the slide exam in art history, that terrifying moment um, when these two images went up. And I think that that kind of moment of panic um, before you start thinking like, oh, it might be about the textiles or the color of the pigments, or could it be about a kind of teleological argument, that moment before that happens, I think is the power of juxtaposition. Once we start naming the differences or similarities, uh, I think we move to comparison, as Allison said earlier. So here we're looking for similarities as opposed to identifying differences. So the magic of, of juxtaposition, I think, is that poetic moment of freedom and not knowing. Um, it seems to occur in a very short interval of time. Once we put words on it, it goes away. So I'm assuming that most people here uh, probably can't identify um, these works. Maybe you think uh, one is African because I'm an Africanist. Um, maybe quickly you discover that the other is a reliquary. So you scan uh, back and forth, and now you might start to pick up on the fact that there are relics and bones included in both, that there are wondrous things that we find in nature that get assembled, um, that there are human uh, uh, things that humans have made, things that, again, have been found in nature, that maybe you're starting to move towards a the realization that these are both used in altars, with yet other things um, brought to those altars and enlivened through multi-sensory ritual. So as soon as that happens, I think the magic of juxtaposition goes away. They fall quickly into order. So is it true that the longer we keep the question of intention at bay, the greater the power of juxtaposition? This is a question I found kind of interesting to consider in my own field of African art. So this is a, an object called a boccio. It's a power object uh, made by the Fong in Benin. And I think it's a great example of the aesthetic of assemblage in African art. So juxtaposition is central to this tenet of African aesthetics. Um, it brings together things from various orders. So again, things we find in nature, things that we make as human beings. Oftentimes, it includes objects that were traded or valued for their exoticism. Different types of material are added to this object, solids and liquids. So this object received various types of sacrifices, like some kind of creamed um, millet or grain would be poured over it, the blood of a chicken. It has visible layers, and it has hidden layers. It's an object that's put on an altar with others, um, and other types of material are again added. There's an a aspect of speech, um, so chanting um, and a kind of ritual uh, presence that is added to these uh, objects. So these materials and actions have various properties, real and metaphorical, but they are parts that stay parts and they are not synthesized into a whole. They can easily be broken apart and reconfigured. There is a contingency to African art that keeps juxtaposition in play the different orders remain different. The question of intention, again, I think is really interesting here. The ability to activate and harness the power of these different orders requires the specialized knowledge of a priest. This is too much for an ordinary mortal to handle. The average viewer and kind of user of these works has no way of accessing the maker or priest's intention but can only guess at why he is bringing these various orders together. Moving into my reflections about my curatorial practice, juxtaposition is very much at the heart of what curators do at places like the Manil and the Pulitzer, especially where you cannot depend on text. Here, it is understood that you can tee up certain juxtapositions and then trust that objects and their viewers will do the work. 
You cannot insist on a singular outcome. You must be satisfied with the idea that the visitor may, if you are successful, experience a qualitative change of mental state, small or big. This was the lesson of chance encounters for me. Uh, my charge as a new curator here was to curate an exhibition about what motivated the Diminals to be collectors of African art, who influenced them, how these objects related to the collection as a whole, to basically give a kind of history and context, but to do this without words. My research uh, showed that they were motivated by spiritual and humanist interests uh, that are clearly traceable in the archives to Couturier, that they had a connection to modern art um, that helped them move towards African and non-Western art. Again, we can document this. There was a big part of their civil rights agenda that motivated them to get interested in African art. They were interested in African art in its own right. They were interested in pushing for a wider respect for non-Western uh, objects. All of this was documentable, and it was a story that I really wanted to show, um, tell, I guess is a better way of putting it. My impulse was really that I wanted to bring you along on a journey that showed you I had done my homework. There was this evidence in the archive. We can find the story, and we can tell it in a really convincing way. So I wanted to do that in chronological order. I wanted you to kind of go on this narrative through me. And I began to think about how that would look and feel as an exhibition, and it became clear pretty fast that this would not work. I was thinking like an author and not a curator. So for help, I looked back um, into the Manila history and found the master of uh, juxtaposition here, Jermaine McHagee, um, and thought about what Jermaine McHagee, what the Manila's and their collaborators had done, how had they, um, how had they created these experiences and, and, um, and told their, their stories. Um, so Jermaine McKagey uh, did this incredible exhibition uh, in 1959 at the Museum of Fine Arts called Totems Not Taboo. And this, to me, is a great exhibition uh, that, that anchors itself into juxtaposition. Just the objects we see here come from all over the continent of Africa all over the Pacific. There were also objects from um, uh, pre-Columbian traditions included in the show. Um, so she's mixing everything together and putting you very much at the center of that experience. The Diminal's house, I think, is another place where we see juxtaposition in play. So they mix things from all different times and places. And there's something about the house as a kind of um, inspiration for curators here that reminds you that you can bring these things together and they don't have to stay in that configuration forever. There's something about a domestic experience that seems more free. You can move things around more easily. So using these um, and many other insights from uh, the, the Minnow Pass, I developed this exhibition, Chance Encounters, uh, that my, my goal was really to, to use the six different spaces um, to create six different experiences that would make you feel that you had gone on a journey from one place to the next, that things were changing from one gallery to the next, juxtapositioning the, juxtapositioning the experience from the first gallery in the top left-hand corner. That was very much about Father Couturier, about spiritualism, about their point of departure. So the second gallery on the top right was really about Totems Not Taboo, Jermaine McHagee, uh, the third gallery was about you know, the civil rights agenda. The, third, the fourth and fifth are kind of this unfurling towards this kind of more humanist agenda and the place of African art as part of a larger collection at the end. What I really learned was that I needed to accept that maybe you as a viewer wouldn't go into the first gallery and think like, yeah, Father Couturier. But that you would go in there and have a kind of experience like there's some, there's a kind of treatment of these objects. There's a a rhythm, there's a sense of light, um, and we use light, rhythm, pacing, color, um, concentration of objects or distribution of them into a wider space to change that experience. And that the, the key takeaway for me here was that this was not about me conveying information to you. It was about creating six different kinds of experiences so that you might kind of imagine how African art um, would, at best, have played a role in the Diminal's own 
journey, but how African art might participate in what you were thinking about that day or, or beyond. So energized by this um, approach, you know, we did an, some other exhibitions where we mixed um, different objects together, and this was uh, an exhibition uh, that we did in East Temporary called Body and Fragments, and again, I think playing on this idea of the house it's about bringing things together in a very temporary way, knowing that you can bring this set of objects together, they'll probably never be together in that kind of configuration again. Knowing it's a three month show, it's a small space, suddenly you have this kind of freedom to play around with the collection that I think um, is otherwise kind of hard to take advantage of. So when I think about sort of what works about juxtaposition, what makes me excited about it, it's very much this idea that it's temporary, that it can be undone, short in duration. It's a thing before you start naming and categorizing. It is something that really activates the viewer in the curatorial practice. It allows you um, to, play, to play a role, to get involved, to try to puzzle it out. It's inviting, it's generous. It allows for wildly different orders of things to exist in the same space. It creates a mental space for the idea that all of these discrete things in time and space can be present. And it's something that seems sort of horizontal instead of vertical in order. As Allison said, it's really about putting things next to each other instead of bringing a kind of order to them. And there is something, I think, deeply human about this impulse to juxtapose different orders. Here we're looking at, on the left, an offering from the Temple of Mayor the Aztec temple in Mexico City built between the 14th and 16th century that brings man-made things, exotic things acquired through trade, uh, things of nature, things of high culture, things of low culture, uh, next to a medieval reliquary display that brings you know, the relics of various different um, types and saints together. A Baroque altar on the left, a contemporary Haitian altar on the right. And looking back to um, the 17th century image of one of the, the first documented cabinets of curiosities. And on the right, the German art historian Abby Warburg's last project uh, called Atlas, uh, which he started in 1927 that brought things together like, uh, these are some of his uh, subject headings, coordinates of memory astrology and mythology, archaeological models, migrations of the ancient gods. In reading about Warburg's scholarship recently, I came upon this quote by Hugo von Hofmannsthal, an Austrian literary critic that captures the spirit of juxtaposition. I quote, the poet is unable to pass by anything, however inconspicuous, that there is something like morphine in the world and that there was ever something like Athens or Rome and Carthage, that there have been human markets and that there are human markets. The existence of Asia and Tahiti or ultraviolet rays and the skeletons of prehistoric animals. This handful of facts and the myriad of such facts from all orders of things are somehow always there for him, waiting for him somewhere in the dark. He must reckon with them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Christina. Our last speaker today will be David Levi Strauss. Formerly on the faculty at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College, he's now chair of the graduate program in art criticism and writing at the School of Visual Arts in New York. A critic and poet, Strauss was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2003, and in 2007, he received the Infinity Award for writing from the International Center of Photography. His criticism appears in a wide array of publications, including Art Forum, Art Journal, The Nation, Cabinet, and Time. And his books include Between the Eyes, Essays on Photography and Politics from 2005, From Head to Hand, Art in the Manual in 2010, and Words Not Spent Today by Smaller Images Tomorrow, his most recent collection of essays published last year. Will you please join me in welcoming David Levi Strauss. Thank you, Allison. I think Allison invited me here um, partly because my first two published collections 
of essays that are titled Between Dog and Wolf in 1999 and Between the Eyes. Uh, when I published those two, people started to ask me if every book that I wrote from then on it would start with Between, but I, I broke the habit. Um, so, but I have been between for a long time. Um, oops. Actually, I began between uh, as a poet and a photographer. Poetry is already between sound and image. But what always fascinated me most was what happened when you put words uh, together with images, what happens between the two. Barth called it the third meaning, and Burroughs and Geisen called it the third mind. I don't know why I didn't become a filmmaker, um, since cinema is all about the juxtaposition of words and images, or sound and image, but I didn't go that way. It was mostly an accident of uh, lack of resources. So I um, instead made poor man's films uh, on paper, juxtaposing words with catch together images. The main work in that vein was called Odile and Odette, um, and it's never really been published altogether. I recently saw Jean-Luc Godard's uh, latest film, Goodbye to Language, and I think it's, it's the best work of art I've seen in a long time dealing with the, the shift that we're going on and the rapidly changing uh, relation between word and image. And I've developed a theory about that, uh, this epical shift that we're currently in and have been in for some time, from linear writing to the image, and that's part of what I teach in the Art Criticism and Writing Program. Um, we read Giordano Bruno, Marcel Mauss and Eric Havelock, as well as Benjamin Flusser and Dee Dee Huberman. One of my students just wrote about Goodbye to Language and found a remarkable bibliography of all the works that are cited in the film. Uh, it was put together by a guy named T Ted Fent. As you can imagine, you can imagine this is a very uh, long list. It's a 70-minute film, but it, he's citing from over 50 authors, from Apollinaire to Wittgenstein, and 10 composers and many filmmakers. Um, have any of you seen this film here? Uh, it's in 3D, and it does all kinds of things that you're not supposed to do with 3D. So it'll, it'll be in 3D and then it'll suddenly, suddenly superimpose something on it. And you um, take the glasses off and throw them away. But um, it induces hypnagogic and hypnopompic states in the viewers. And um, consequently, you have to see it over and over again because you missed parts because you were asleep. Um, Sometimes the gaps between images open up so wide that you, uh, a viewer will get swallowed up between them. All of the action in the film happens in the juxtaposition, so the film really only exists between things. And I've come to realize over the years that this is really always where the, where the action is between things. In an interview that Mark Durant just did with me for his St. Lucie site, he said that a publication I did in the 80s called In Relation had a significant impact on him, prompting his, quote, realization that meaning is made in relationship between things, that things don't have intrinsic meaning, but that we establish meaning vis-a-vis. -vis. I can't quite go that far because I still believe in the life of things too much, but I understand his impulse. When I say I believe in the life of things in themselves, I'm mostly talking about art objects. Before I came to the Art Criticism and Writing Program at SVA, I taught for five years at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College from 2000 to 2005. When I came in there, I really didn't know anything about curating because I'd never done it. 
well, I had, I had curated one, one show of Ralph Haig's sculptures and uh, juxtaposed with Robert Frank's photographs. And I loved doing it, but uh, because I didn't have to do any of the um, tedious things that real curators have to do, uh, they, they left me alone for the most part. I just came in and put things together in a room, and, and that was fantastic uh, for me. So when I came to the Center for Curatorial Studies, I imagined that anyone who wanted to be a curator would have to know how to do at least, at least two things coming in. Um, they would have to know how to look at a work of art and then account for their experience of it in a compelling way. And they would have to know how to juxtapose to place works of art in a room in a way that would make them sing. So I was shocked when I came to Bard uh, to find that very few, almost none, of uh, the students could do either one of those two things. This caused me to look into the history of curating, uh, really the history of the independent curator, and I ended up writing a, an essay titled The Bias of the World, Curating After Zaman and Hops, that was published in a book for curators and reprinted many times. Obviously, I don't need to tell anyone here about Harold Zaman and, and especially Walter Hobbs. I call them the cosmos and Damien of curating of contemporary curatorial practice. What I learned teaching at CCS was that most of the students there had an image of the curator as a free agent, uh, capable of almost anything, and that image came from people like Zeman and Hobbs, when they both died in February and March 2005 at age 72 and 71, respectively, it, it was impossible not to see this as the end of an era. So we have before us two different kinds of juxtaposition, accidental juxtaposition and intentional juxtaposition. And the relation between these two is, again, where the energy lies. In our current communications environment, we have virtually unlimited access to words and images. We live in the golden age of search. I don't think it'll last forever, so uh, enjoy it while it lasts. And are subject to virtually continuous delivery of these words and images on proliferating devices and surfaces. Speed is of the essence, and as Paul Virilio told us long ago, speed has a politics. It takes time to decode images and to read words. And to see what's happening between words and images, one has to slow them down. This was um, supposed to be the cover of my book. And uh, we were told uh, by White House lawyers that they would definitely come after us if we used this image. Um, they said it was illegal, or I guess not illegal, but uh, frowned upon to use an image of a sitting president on the cover of a book. This turns out to be nonsense, but that's, that's the reason that they gave. So there's a lot of confusion these days about what happens if you don't slow, uh, don't slow them down if what happens between words and images occurs at a constant high velocity. We've known about subliminal messaging and the unconscious for a long time, but this is a new level of that that we've moved into. And frankly, I don't know what the effects of the current environment uh, are going to be over time. 
but I guess that's, that's one of the things that we're here to talk about. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite the speakers to join me at the table and we'll have a round table conversation and afterwards I'll open up the, uh, the floor to audience questions. start off, each one of you have approached this topic from a di very different perspective. And I want to start off sort of with that big question of what are the stakes of this argument? Um, each of you have addressed curating in a different way, have addressed writing about images in a different way. And I'm interested to know, is this just a sort of boutique question for curators and writers to consider and how they address issues in their own practice? Or is this a relevant topic for how we can maybe even be held accountable as people who are uh, tasked with displaying, interpreting, and presenting artworks to a public? I know that's kind of a big question to just throw out there on the first, but I thought, go big or go home on the first go. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all, you know, we're all doing Make it sure all the time. Close. We're all doing it all the time. Um, and this, again, the speed of, of um, how it's happening is, makes it difficult to slow things down enough to see its moving parts. So I, I think that's probably, um, with my students, I spend a lot of time talking about how to slow things down. I mean, there are things that can happen at speed with velocity, but, um, but there are things that can happen there. And uh, so it's, it's necessary to find new ways to, to, to slow things down. It's, it's, very difficult to do now. I think one of the things that your topic has made me struggle with the most is the question of intention and what you just um, raised at the end of, of your comments about you know, what is the difference between accidental and an intentional juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like we're all struggling with um, uh, accountability in juxtaposition and how much of um, how much control there is in putting some things together and anticipating where the viewer can go with what you've put together. Mm -hmm. for, for me, um, as I mentioned before, I think the, uh, maybe I'm the only one saying that, so I'm careful, <laughs> but it's, uh, I think the major problem is the, the transformation of our society and culture. I mean, you, you touched on it but it's also the, the role of, of museums. I mean, you can, because juxtaposition, it happens all the time, it's everywhere, we put stuff together, I mean, it's always there. But what we have to rethink uh, of is the, the role of museums. When you go and ask, uh, for example, why did you do that show to a, to a curator or to a, um, maybe, I, maybe I always talk to the wrong people in museums, maybe that's right. <laughs> but uh, the answer is always, well, because you know, I, I like it, or because I had a fight with a, a curator from Pasadena uh, who in public said, uh, well, I said, what, what did you do that show for? Because I like it, I like the, I like the artist, and I like this, I like that. And my, my response was, well, as a, who cares? <laughs> I mean, why should I care about what you like? Mm -hmm. Like, tell me, explain to me, why do you want to impose this on me? Because it's an imposition, the way it's organized, it's like it's like a, a it's like a propaganda thing, a, a show. So uh, if we continue to do that type of things, and we don't want to argue to discuss the, the reason for production of shows, I think we are we are in trouble uh, because it seems to me that again the world has changed tremendously and the public has changed tremendously for for museums. They're not the same. It's not the same the same thing. And now we have just just tried to go to the Louvre, for example, right? I mean, you cannot even get in. It's, a, it's absolutely fascinating. And the, 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 there's a talk at the Louvre now to actually close down rooms because it's too dangerous. 
First of all, you cannot do selfies, right? I mean, that's a, you cannot carry those sticks and you, know, you can't do that. But you cannot even, actually, some places you cannot even see the work, right? So they have to, because also the Louvre is also something specific. I mean, it's an old-fashioned museum as well. It's, a, it's an iconic stuff. So you go to see icon. You don't have to understand anything. You just you are, you are impressed, and that's it. And you can write a postcard to your grandmother that you saw it. That's it. So the, uh, uh, I know a curator at the Louvre who tried to, to change this. After two years, he was fired. Mm. Because he wanted to have uh, meaningful shows organized with their collections and also bringing some other things. For example, he wanted to, he wanted to talk about violence at some, at some point, violence and sexuality. So he mixed uh, some 17, uh, uh, 16th century drawings <coughs> with Yves Klein. I mean, he did the show, but he was fired because of that. But Serge, so uh, that's a, a juxtaposition that could have been interesting, even if I'm not too hot about it. But I mean, it, it was interesting. Yeah, there's this phrase that you just used, the meaningful exhibitions, I think. And I think that maybe might be getting to this central topic of how do you create meaningful exhibitions? I mean, it's either using trusting that the viewer will be able to understand this thing. I mean, that's kind of what I started off with is, is a juxtaposition an argument or is it a suggestion? And how do we work with that as, as practitioners? Well, my quick question uh, answer would be, uh, um, I don't like to be in awe or to produce something to be in awe because in awe means that you don't think. You're just in awe. So you, you go in as a public and you, you just don't. So I think it's a, we have to find ways to, and we try, some, people, some places are trying that, to try to, to bring in some kind of discussion. It's more, maybe more difficult to do that on contemporary art because, um, well, I don't know, because the historical dimension, and maybe, maybe I'm not sure. But it, it is very important to produce works that when we write a book, is because we have something to say. And if we do a show, it's because we have something to say. And, and I think to leave it uh, floating right there in the middle of nowhere and people passing by without any kind of uh, real direct uh, confrontation you know, with, with the ideas of the curator of the museum, I think is, is a waste of time. Hmm. I'm tough about that because I really, I really think that this is important to change, and the museum, some museum directors are trying to, to, to change that. But of course, and after that, I shut up. The problem is also the financing of museums and articulation, because uh, several years ago, for example, in different, some countries like in France or Canada, for example, the state was giving money and to curators who were discussing and so on and so on. And so on. now they don't give money at all. So now it's just only private uh, money. And like in Canada, we see the difference. Uh, the, the curators uh, are subjected to the pressure of the donor to have shows that they want and they like, and that's it. Or tourism. So for example, in Vancouver, in our museum, in the last 10 years, we have had, I don't know how many shows of Cezanne. Cezanne when he was a young kid, Cezanne in the Middle Ages, Cezanne when he's dying, and so on. Uh, you know, uh, Salvador Dali, that you're up to here. Uh, I mean, you on and on and on. I mean, it's a disaster. And so, because they need the money, and if, if they would say, I do one show like this, and then we have serious shows, I would kind of accept it. But the way it's going now, no. But there's a, reason, there's a reason why all of these people are going to the Louvre and to the Manil and to the, why these crowds are happening, because... Um, Tourism? Well, I don't think it's just that. I think it's... Um, I think people are trying to uh, slow, slow things. It's a way to slow things down. I mean, when you... When I'm you're, slowing down. Oh. To, it takes time to look at something. I mean, it takes time to look at two things together and deal with the, the space between, but it takes time to look at... A lot of that degree with that, yes, yes. And, you know, I mean, you can, yes. you can interfere with that um, with your devices, but... No, no, I agree with that. No, but it's more, it's, it was, I was more talking about the, um, the, the role of the, the Louvre as an ever, You know, the Louvre started to be a democratic situation. I mean, that was it. They lost it completely. Because mm -hmm. what they call democracy is that group of people who are like cows going to the slaughterhouse. That's not democracy, right? And so the slaughter, mm -hmm. you said, not. of course, of course, slowness, I mean, is important to understand, to integrate, and so on. But if the presentation is in, in such a way that nobody knows, it, you have to know 
That's what I, my point I was talking about. The old museum, like the Museum of Modern Art, was fantastic at the time because they were addressing a very specific uh, cr crowd, very specific, uh, sophisticated, uh, rich groups. Mm. After a moment, after a while, then we had the Google now who say, oh, hey, 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 this is a different world. I think we're right. Let's, let's have factories, big buildings, attract the people. Who cares about what we present? Just go to the Bilbao Museum. It's a nightmare, mm. right? I mean, maybe you disagree, but I think it's a, it's a fun nightmare. I mean, just look at some of the artists who are doing stuff really funny about the museum, and like making think, fun of I think that one has to be careful about painting museums, all museums, with too broad no, no, a brushstroke. Right. I mean, the Louvre is a very particular situation. The Manila is a, a very different one still. Specific, and yes. I think that institutions like this one um, have a real responsibility to do risk-taking and adventurous mm -hmm. projects, things that are maybe more, more difficult and not as much of a crowd pleaser because you know, there are agree, different yeah. sets of um, constraints and, and possibilities. Um, but the comments that you were making about how the structure of the museum um, either allows or constraints, um, juxtaposition, or, or more ad adventurous um, ideas, I think is a really um, important one. Um, when I think about how museum collections um, are, are treated and how precious they become, the, uh, you know, the whole apparatus around of just getting loans for exhibitions, moving objects from one place to another, the professionalization of the conservation um, Discipline. I mean, all of these things have made objects very encumbered, and it, it is difficult, difficult yeah. to move um, things around quickly. And I wonder how we can challenge ourselves as museum professionals and art historians to think about other ways, um, other kind of object delivery systems that we can provide for our public. So if everything doesn't have to be a permanent exhibition, or I mean a permanent installation or a temporary exhibition, I mean, can we think about opportunities for juxtaposition with the collection where like this weekend we're going to have a pop-up show. We don't have to come up with all of the um, vitrines and the, um, you know, all the little devices and maybe we don't show things in the way that you're used to them, but, you know, we can show a lot, a lot more, a lot faster and just get things, you know, get, get the incredible things in our collections out and kind of use this tool of juxtaposition, I think, in a very effective way. Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> no, but because it's a, well, that's one thing, but th my question is like, why do you want to do this though? I mean, why do you, it's always the question like, why do you want to do that, that type of show? Uh, and in museum world, um, it's always a, it's always positive, right? You always have to be positive in your stuff. I totally disagree. And, and I, would, I would give you an example. Uh, for example, uh, I agree, I, I will tell you, I'll do the show right away tomorrow, wherever you are. <clears throat> because that's something I asked for a director of the, museum, of the new museum in New York, who's a friend of mine, and um, I said, okay, what I would like to do is to have a show about all the artists, contemporary from 60s on, that I don't like. And have a show of everything I don't like, and I will explain why I don't like it. I'll Who do cares? A, I'll do a Who show cares? I'll do a show tomorrow <laughs> with you anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, they are, no, you cannot do that. Well, who cares? It's because by doing this, you show that there, there is, um, there is a, 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 a movement that you, a museum has to be positive. You cannot be negative. You are, everything is, is positive. It's always, ha, ha, ha. The world is like this? Uh-huh. It's not. So I think it's interesting to, to, to create an exhibition who talk about tensions, about differences, about all that stuff. And, and so and a curator should have a, a thesis about each, word, each, uh, each show they do. They don't say, oh, I don't like the people who say, well, I put this there and there. I mean, oh, who cares? That's the word a la mode these days, right? Who cares? You go to students and they all say that. Oh, who cares? Well, this, that, does it matter? At the contemporary art world, we end up, and I said, which I don't like very much, but I'm afraid what's going to happen pretty soon is that we're going to call for a Greenberg again. Because a mess is like, everything is OK, everything is same. And we lost the, the, the debate, the battle, because it's all the thing is for sale. So, oh, it doesn't matter. So we are transformed the art world into a supermarket. We can buy all kinds of brands of uh, you know, cookies or whatever. And, and uh, nobody really cares. And I care, actually. I care about to take us artists seriously is not to do this. It's to actually take seriously what they are saying. 
and to put them in perspective of the period of what they were doing or in relationship to other movements or other things. The fight is wonderful. They were doing that stuff for some reason, not because they, they just wanted to make money or this big, maybe now, I don't know. Uh, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if there is nothing at stake in our world of museum, we are going, I mean, downhill. It's just awful. I think it's pretty awful. You have a me, maybe you disagree with me, maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, go ahead. Yeah, we can open the go floor ahead. to questions now. Joseph? No, just disagree. Okay. <laughs> no, it's too simple. It's just too much in the same box, I think. But yeah. Um, and I think, you know, to, uh, uh, to your sort of uh, command that you have to have a thesis is in a way also already very restricting, no? Because then that, I think the danger with that is that you use objects to illustrate your theory. But no. objects have a life of their own also. No, 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 no. What I mean is that, uh, I'll take the example of the of B-bomb. If you try to, you already have a, um, a, a subject, not a topic, but you have a subject. And then when you, uh, I work with periods. So if you work about that period, you have to kind of, when you look, you do the research and so on and so forth, uh, you have all those elements, but you have to kind of, uh, it seems to me, the role of a curator, because if, if that's not the role of a curator to think and to uh, articulate a, a thesis, as I said, you become like a, a person who kind of collects stamps and you put them on the walls. That's not very interesting to me. So what is interesting to me is, the, is, a, is, a, is a dialogue, a debate with the art, with the structure, with the history, with the archives, and with the public. Those things have to be going on all together. But they are. They are, they're gonna go on anyway. I mean, I, no, I didn't well, grow up go, uh, going to museums, but when I discovered museums, they were, uh, they were always a place of freedom for me because nobody was, until they started putting things in your ear, but nobody, uh, uh, else, so. yeah, yeah yes. but, Nobody was telling me what to think about these things. I was free to do that and to make the connections to make the, to fill in the gaps between myself. Yeah, but it was always a very and I think that's a valuable uh, thing to do. I don't think that needs to be changed particularly. I mean, I think it needs to be, uh, and I think that's why the crowds are going to these museums because they're hungry for that, and leave it to people. Okay, so, uh, to, so to make their own connections and their own choices about it. Yeah, but the problem is that the uh, life is not like that, and history is not like that. If you don't know anything about history, you just uh, we end up. But I know. So I'm going to say something awful, right? But in <laughs> France, I really, I really done it, right? I already said <laughs> yes, that. <yeah. laughs> um, you have to, for example, in order to understand history, for example, you have to, or science for that matter, you have to be aware. Uh, if I don't know Chinese language, I cannot enjoy poetry, Chinese poetry. I mean, it's pretty simple. Actually, I don't believe that at all. I uh, see. Uh, well, so we disagree. I don't tell you more than I thought. I yes, you, I don't believe that with art. Um, I believe that a piece of art will tell you how to look at it if you look at it. I think just I mean, getting people to the point where they're actually taking the time to look at something is extremely valuable. I it's agree. what's missing outside the museum. And creating a, a, a context and a, an experience where people can have confidence in their ability to look. And that, I mean... I, to look, we, what is to look? To look is not controlled by... I mean, theory... Well, I, I, mean, I think that's... Theory the, has been... Theory but I think that's like the central argument that we're having is really one about control and that's about right. controlling other people's looking. And I mean, there is a certain amount of responsibility one accepts in presenting something in a particular place and you know there's a set of politics clearly associated with that but the idea that like if you so let me tell you an example from my own field and how surprising the manila was to me when i got here trained as an africanist i was um really taught that something would go terribly wrong if i presented african art to the audience and didn't present the the origin story first like that was the first stop. If you understood that the Chihuahua mask came from Mali, agrarian society, and was used in a festival every year, you were good to go, then you were free to have your experience, but like something would go dangerously off the rails if you didn't know that information first. When I think of how I 
came to African art. It was through a breadth requirement at the University of Wisconsin. I had to take a class outside of modern and contemporary. I saw a nail, what's called a nail fetish in Nkisi go up on the screen, and I was blown away. Then I did this thing. I went to the library, I checked out a book, and I started learning about it. And that is what I think, it, that's the kind of confidence that I have in people when they're looking, that if I can create a context for them um, to, to slow down and to spend some time that they too can discover what they're interested in and pursue it and read your books and everybody else's you know, yeah, books yeah. get involved in programs. I mean, there's levels of deep yes, knowledge. So that in, that, in that case, I mean, I don't need a museum to do that. I go to a forest and I'm absolutely impressed by a tree and I fall in love with exactly. this and stuff. Great. Well, yeah, but that's, the, but that's is everywhere. So what's the, but that's the purpose of an institution it's always interesting. I mean, I'm going back to my awful example that I was going to talk about. <laughs> if we don't know history, for example, you can imagine what happens when you don't know history. You, can, you have a larger amount of people in France right now who have no, no education because the education system collapsed and they have no history, no sense of stuff. Do you know what they do now? They vote Marie Le Pen, okay? So that's what I'm saying, it was exaggerated. But, but at the, the same time. Or the institution but, going to become this pedagogical like, no, whip? But, I mean, hey, listen, I'm a, I'm a guy from 68. I, I was That's whipped why, by the yeah. system. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that you don't have to have it. It's, I, I, no, it's absolutely I crucial. Think, but wouldn't engaging with something and wanting to know about it drive you towards want, wanting to know about history as too, opposed to like, too, I, I saw, your I saw a lot. I saw shit on the, on the surface of uh, Rosenberg. I loved it. And I, I went to it. I went to American art and so on. Yeah, Everybody is like that. We are, of course, yes. But I really think that it is important to have a, a discussion and a debate. I, I'm, 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 I pronounce the word democracy. I don't know. I realize that democracy is not really the way it used to be, not even in the 60s, but even in the 19th century, it seems to me. And it's because we lost this, because of the, this, this kind of um, uh, the, the, the ex expansion of, uh, of a public, large, like they go to, and, they are, and they want time. I agree with that. But mm. that's not enough, though, because, because you ask questions yourself. You say, w w what is this? is this there? For example, you have the question, how come the French have all those Italian Renaissance paintings on the wall and everybody comes there? How come they are not in Italy? Interesting question. And uh, Napoleon did it. And so we actually did, at the Louvre, we wanted to do an exposition, an exhibition like this, to show in a room that is actually painted in the 19th century about all the, the victory of Napoleon. And they wanted to have in that room, and actually they did it in the Louvre, and the public Start, uh, understand that right away, the connection between what he stole and, and what he, you know, his discourse about the mountains, I mean, the, 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 the battles and so on. They try to do this. They say, you know, uh, there's a lot of history behind those pictures, be mm -hmm. behind the Louvre and so on and so forth. So that's kind of interesting to do, it seems to me. But if you say to the people, as I said, like a, like a, a, a group, go, and, uh, and, and I mean, to me, so we don't need museums, really. We don't need curators. Mm -hmm. We don't need curators, really. Maybe we'll open the floor up to a couple of questions. Let me, let me rub some salt on the wound. I'm a writer, I'm a curator, and a pin curator, and we belong to the 60s. And uh, we have to implode lies. That's our duty, and you have said this very clearly, Serge, in several ways. So what I would like to address here is a, a contradiction. Because we have heard here the idea of uh, juxtaposition, but as proposal. We haven't seen that we are under fire for several kind of why oppositions and juxtapositions. For instance, two, and before I'm saying you the contradictions, I would like to tell you that to, to think how do we convey meaning is absolutely naive. naive in the world we are living now. In this world, you have two ways. One is the image and the other is the text. And the new generation, as far as I know, every day is much less interested in text or in meaning. They are not even see faces. They are absolutely involved in the face of a let's say, Blackberry. So, this generation, how do you convey meaning when 
the process is leading you that there will be no text anymore. And uh, Levi Strauss directed this idea of Godard about the disappearance of language. One more thing is, if you are interested in knowledge, you need to take into account this that is happening. For meaning, you need time. And you're leading a generation or a world which is crowded by thousands of messages absolutely unimportant and they have no time for meaning. That's my position, I don't know if that stresses a little bit that we are beyond the proposal of the juxtapositions. We are under fire of juxtapositions. Okay. I was wondering if you could uh, maybe tease out some of the argument that's going on because it seems to me that the, the difference might be one in terms of uh, one's relationship to the arrest or suspension, because maybe, Levi, you could talk a little bit about the sequence of images uh, in which you remained silent and you went from the body of Michael Brown to the Helen Levitt, uh, the Helen Levitt image, which is, there's a provocative story that you're telling by not saying something. And Ka Katrina, uh, it seems to me that you Christina, excuse me, in the uh, room that was the mustard-colored room that you showed briefly, there, there were a series of relationships that would, again, take quite a bit of, of discursive uh, uh, duration to tease out. But it, it seems to me that the allowing for something to just be suspended is, as opposed to having what Serge seems to be arguing for is, is a predetermined hypothesis is the kind of difference between uh, the one's relationship to, to juxtaposition. Maybe you could discuss that. I don't, I don't know whether, I mean, I, I wish that we could have an argument, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep trying to pursue it, but at the, in the end, I don't know whether we really disagree that much about. I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that, I mean, the reason I showed those images without commentary is that is to demonstrate that there are we're making these connections all the time that hasn't changed uh, because as long as we're walking around in these bodies with these appendages and with these um, th this is what happens we take things in we make connections we uh, uh, we fill in the blanks and um, that's going to happen no matter what. I mean, I agree that the, there is this epical shift going on from linear writing to the image. It's a fact. It's not, you can't stop it. You can't go back. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the end of meaning. I don't think, uh, I don't think it is. Um, I think the whole problem with meaning uh, has more to do with when, when we decided that we would turn everything into information, including image and text, um, the, way, the way that we did that was by removing context and meaning and everything out of it. That, when you take those things out, then it becomes particles of information that you can move around freely, and that's the world that we live in now. Um, but the process of making meaning between things has not stopped and it's not going to stop. Um, it looks different. It happens on different surfaces, on different uh, screens. The screens are somewhat different. There's something happening with the image lifting off the screen now that I'm trying to write about. Um, but, um, you know, I, I guess, Serge is impatient. He wants, he wants this all to happen every time, uh, uh, and he wants to encourage the He's conflict. Um, I, I say that, that that's gonna, it's gonna happen. Take your time. Just, yeah, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> It'll happen. It's, it's, it's happening, uh, you know, whether, whether we pay attention to it or not. Um, but paying attention to it, I guess, is the point. Um, and that takes time to pay attention. 
And I am in patience because I'm getting old. <laughs> you young kid. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I guess just to respond to your uh, question, I would really point back to the De Mendel House and you know, kind of thinking about that in comparison to that image you referred to of the mustard color room body and fragments. Um, you know, we were really kind of playing around with the ideas from the house there that there is something about going to the house and the kind of freedom that you permit yourselves um, to, or one permits oneself to make these kinds of connections and to let your mind um, play that um, as soon as you put that combination of objects in an institution, you know, it, those possibilities aren't as wide open. But I mean, one of the things I've, I've enjoyed about the way this institution looks at its um, collection is it's very elastic. So those objects can perform in one way at the house, in one way in that exhibition, and another way in various galleries, and other ways in scholarship or other people's um, exhibitions. But you know, back to Joseph's point, the objects have these lives, and they can handle these you know various demands that we that we put on them. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Or none. <laughs> yeah. Um, just if you have a traveling show, I mean, how important is the context and the audience? I mean, you know, I don't know, different cities, different countries, or whatever. I mean, do you take that into account when you're figuring out what juxtapositions might be resonate at a particular place or with a particular audience? Or do you think that would be the same throughout? Hmm. I've never organized a traveling show, so I'm going to let the professional speak. <laughs> you, you, sorry. Well, that was, um, that was uh, something that my collaborator on Progress of Love, B.C. Silva from the Center for Contemporary Art in Lagos, thought very much about. Um, when she agreed to do the show as a collaboration with the Manil and then the Pulitzer joined later, um, she said she would do it as long as we didn't make one show and move it around from location to location because what her audience wanted, needed, and desired in Lagos was very different than what we were doing here or in, um, in St. Louis. So that was a question very much at the front of our minds um, when we were working on that, that project. Um, no. What the, oops. Go ahead. Yeah. No, the only thing the only thing I would say I think is in response to something you said before, um, to let to let the, the, the person kind of you know go over there and sort of go to the, to the show and f be free. But you, you use the word free. Mm -hmm. My problem is that I don't think we are free. See, that's the thing. That uh, we always have uh, ideological uh, control. We are controlled. We are framed. We are this and that. Not in, in different Outside ways. The museum. In different ways. Inside the museum, we're free. Well, that's yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Out, oh, outside love, the museum, I love, I love those utopian minds. <laughs> Out, outside the museum, we have a, yes. a whole host of people who are very good at controlling what we see and what we think about it and what we take from it. And, and they're busy 24 hours a day doing it. And in the museum, only half the time, but they do it too. <laughs> well, so that's a, and that's a what hope. that's what that's what I think. There is a there is a move now in, in some museums to to change that to change that attitude to say that we don't see anywhere the white cube anymore, right? Uh, because that will also mean something very specific. Mm. So now there is an attempt, I mean, to, to take the, the public seriously, meaning that they have, they have different, they come from different ways, they have been controlled different ways, and so they don't all agree, and they're not going to like that piece and that one, because sometimes maybe uh, Dan Flavin, you know, uh, I mean, <laughs> this is quite funny. Uh, I went to a collector's uh, house in Los Angeles, and all kinds of uh, people would come in, and they, they would, and she says, we are, I have a Dan Flavin, you know? And to show you, those people really wanted to learn something, but they didn't learn anything, but they, they concentrate all in front of a light that was not the, the, Fla, the Flavin, was another tube. And so the collector has to come to say, well, they were all, uh, no, it's not, it's that one. <laughs> oh, and everybody comes around. So that's what I'm talking about. I refuse to, cre to continue this idea of the public as a bunch of cows who go to the, uh, to the, to, to the thing. I, to the, I don't know, I don't like it. It's not for me, because I don't care. I know this, I know that, I've been, I'm educated in artistry, so I know. But I would say, I would not dare telling somebody 
how to, uh, to operate the brain, because I cannot do it. I don't know. Doctors are going to tell me that, and they're going to help me to understand. So that's what we should be doing also, and not thinking that art is different. It's like everybody would get it. Wait uh -huh. a minute. Did, uh -huh. you just, did you just compare art historians to physicians? Physicians, yes. Oh, dear. <laughs> There, I finally find something to disagree on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, it was a metaphor. It was a metaphor. <laughs> all right, well, I think we're just about out of time, so I want to thank my speakers. All of you, please give a round of applause. And we, we would like to thank Alison to organize all this, though. Absolutely. So thank you very much. <laughs>